Now that I am, you know what age, I think back and I think it was so extraordinary, except that I only realize it now. My father was a Puerto Rican who studied under the system of the United States after the Spanish-American War. So he was bilingual. And since there was no occasion for him to work in Puerto Rico, he went to Mexico and with a theater company from Spain. He was the accountant, the prompter. Do you know what a prompter is? Before we have all this paraphernalia, they had a man who pronounced very well and read the whole drama for those uh, playing in case, in case they forgot it. You had to pronounce very well, and you know they would not hear you. And then he was also an extra. But the Mexican Revolution began. As I found out later on, there was a shooting. My mother entered a store in Puebla. Puebla has one of the best theaters that the America ever built from the colonial times. So the company was there. My father, my future father also took refuge in that uh, store and they met and they were married and the company left Mexico because of the revolution. My father didn't go to go so far, um, went to Veracruz, a port, because being a bilingual accountant, he could find work with an American company and sure enough, they offered him a job in Cuba. So he went there with very good employment, and I was born there. In Camagüey, where I was born, the houses were like in Spain. In front of our house, there was a, a porch, a cover, where people took out their chairs in the afternoon and sat there. And we, children, ran from one end of the block to the other, all being watched by all the families. It was a beautiful childhood. They had built a school. It was a beautiful school, elementary school. Most of the schools in that place were Catholic. And it was a school built like in Spain with an interior patio and the, the classrooms were all around. And I remember the sun coming in, in the classrooms and seeing the sky all the time. The little boys were on the first floor for the boys. We were on the second floor. And since we had to line up to go down and up, the boys were not allowed to go into the patio. There we were with our, with our pleated skirts, and they could not until we all had gone out of the classroom. I had tremendous teachers there. And um, when I was in the third or fourth grade, our assignment was to learn a poem for the next class. We knew the poems of Martí, of Darío, of Juan Ramón Jiménez, mentioned them, even famous poems translated from other languages. You had to recite the poem in front of the class. And if you did a good job, on Fridays, when we, we gathered in the backyard with our uniforms, linen, white linen, little sailor, they called the girl who had recited the poem the best. And then you recited the poem in front of the flag. And then we, we sang the national hymn. Well, I was always chosen. <laughs> <laughs> I love, I love poetry. As I remember it, it was, it was a beautiful time for me because Camagüey is a place with a great reputation, a literary reputation, and a historical reputation. That place seems to me today sort of marvelous. And uh, only later I started thinking about my childhood. And I thought it was the beginning of my interest in letters and teaching and all that. There was born the first great woman poet of the Americas, of Spanish America, Gertrudis Gomez y Avellaneda. And she wrote a sonnet called Al Partir, leaving you or going away. Everybody in Cuba know that, that sonnet by memory. Everybody. It was very beautiful, I still remember it. It began, Perla del Mar, Estrella de Occidente, hermosa Cuba, tu brillante suelo, la noche cubre con su opaco vuelo, 
como cubre el dolor mi triste frente. I left Cuba when I was 14 years old, so it must have been 1934. We left Cuba because Machado, once my brother, my younger brother and I had crossed a corner, and but by a few seconds, we were not killed by the bomb that exploded. Still another time, we were in danger also by shooting. So since my mother was from Mexico, my father from Puerto Rico, my father thought we were not safe there. And with the help of the American consul, um, we were able to leave Cuba in a boat of the Red Cross. We went to Puerto Rico. I tell you the truth, that the pantries are the signal or the typical thing of Cuba. But Puerto Rico is beautiful. The mountains, they compare to Switzerland. A beautiful country. As you know, we had never seen the advertisements on the roads like in the United States. So we came to Puerto Rico to another city of great prestige, Ponce. My aunt there was a teacher. She was also a humanitarian. My aunt cared very much about education. I had attended in Cuba a school, an American school, where I learned to read in English. In Puerto Rico at that time, the books were in English, but the class was discussed in Spanish. So we were able to enter the end of the seventh grade and then the, the eighth grade and I finished the high school in three years. Puerto Rico also contributed to my, to my desire to, to write, to my tendency to literary things. When I was in the high school, my aunt encouraged me to, to ask for scholarships in the United States. And I was very fortunate, and I accepted the scholarship from Vermont. I came to Trinity College when I remember what I was wearing. <laughs> you know, the one dress is completely different over there and wear uniforms. It was fall, and here I was with high heels. <laughs> then I took my train to Vermont. I could not move. I didn't, they sold sandwiches and everything there. I did not dare open my mouth because I knew my English could not be understood by anybody. As the train proceeded, at every station, these girls came into the train. You know, cardigans, saddle shoes, little felt hats. And they started talking. And this lady who was going to Canada had asked me what I was doing. And I said I was going to a college in Vermont called Trinity College of the Sisters of Mercy. <clears throat> so this girl began, every time we stop at a place in Vermont or in the North in New England, they greeted each other and they carry on. <clears throat> she said to me, these girls, are going to the college you are going. So she talked to them, and they all came and surround me. Oh, you are the girl who is coming from Puerto Rico. <clears throat> yes, I was that girl. They took care of me the rest of the time. They helped me with the trunk and the suitcases. They saw to it that I ate. Today, I think, how kind they were. We are right in Vermont. I was there four years. I owe that college everything I am today in a way, and that my family also. Those girls were not rich, they were well to do. The day I arrived, they told me, let us go downtown and take this course, setting tables, waiting on tables. And I wonder why, they say, because in the summer, we all like to go to the lake, wait on table, and we have beautiful vacation. And, and then they give us tips. So I follow, I learn how to set tables, and, uh, I remember like today, I began to dream in English about, after I was there about five months. I, I had to speak English. I mean, in Vermont there was no other Hispanic that I knew of. And uh, I learned soon. I learned soon how to behave and how to, but those classmates of mine and the sisters, I'll never forget them. Every vacation I spent in four years, I didn't go home. The war started, I couldn't go home. Besides, I didn't want to impose on my family to pay for, for a round trip by air. That cost money. And I have found jobs with my classmates in the beautiful lakes of Vermont. I never realized all they were giving me because it was a complete scholarship. I mean, books, tuition, uh, room and board, and love and interest in my future. That's the American way. 
When we graduated, the war had started. Then for the first time in the history of the United States, they went to employ women to women's college to occupy the positions of the men. My entire class was invited to work near Baltimore in what was then a whiskey company. They made Castellas, Calvert. It was a tremendous experience, the Second World War. They trained us. And it was a beautiful life, really. We have a house mother. We behave very nicely. It was like a continuation of college life. Sixty other girls arrived from all colleges in the United States. We had two dormitories. It was like they told us. Then, in about three or four months, about 50 boys arrived. They had been drafted. They had been studying chemistry, like my husband, microbiology. Whether they graduated or were doing their doctorate, they, they gave them a deferment to work for the world effort in laboratories all over the country. You can well imagine what happened. The boys came, we were there, we all married them <laughs> in no time at all. I remember when they announced that we had won the war, all of us went to Washington. It was something like Obama, that people went to the street and embraced each other and cried and all that. It was unforgettable. We married in a few months. My family couldn't come because uh, planes were only for the war effort and uh, neither the family of my husband. But the company gave me a magnificent reception. We lived in a house that had magnificent parlors with mirrors. All of my co-workers arranged for the reception. I had a nice wedding. I made my wedding gown and two other friends of mine borrow it for, the, for their weddings. I have bridesmaids. Two of my dearest classmates managed to arrive in Maryland. I had a flower girl. We were married in church and we have a very, very lovely party. And of course, the custom in my family is that you tell, ask permission to get married. I'm talking about many years ago. So I wrote to my family saying that I had met this wonderful man, a Cornell graduate, a microbiologist that had interrupted his doctorate to help with the war effort. Of course, I said many nice things about my future husband. They had already given me a shower. It was about three days before the wedding when I received the consent from the family. I also wrote the nuns. I had lived with them for years, and I told them I had I was found this wonderful man. I was marrying him. And they told me, it's not this a warm marriage. It was too soon. So when we married, I suggested that we go back to Vermont to where I have my friends and the nuns. We arrived in Vermont. So I went to the convent. I said, I am here with my husband, so you're not him. The mother superior gathered the entire convent, all the nuns. I presented my husband to them. The, <laughs> the sisters who were in a semicircle, they looked him over, asking questions, they approved. And then we stayed there in the dormitory and uh, the next morning, went to the school chapel for mass, but somebody was cooking bacon <laughs> in one of the rooms. So my husband used to say that, I think he's the only person who went to a church where you could smell bacon, not incense. <laughs> and my husband, from then on, told everybody that he had gone to marry me to a convent. <laughs> when the war ended, we lived near Baltimore, and my husband was very anxious to continue his doctorate. The closest university was the University of Maryland. So he applied, and he was given a job as an instructor and uh, a student for the doctorate. One day, I went to a picnic, and the chair of his department, Dr. Faber, of the University of Maryland, asked me if I had a degree. Yes, I had a degree. And what did I study? Hispanic literature. So he said, come and apply. We need people. We had the GI Bill of Rights, where anyone who went to war could go to college 
it doesn't, it didn't matter if you had never gone to college before, you were, you had the right to go four years or to continue your education. You know that the University of Maryland was chosen to train all these soldiers and try to get them to finish the degree in two years. So all the dormitories were occupied by GIs. It was a tremendous program of the University of Maryland. And uh, then they offered me a little over $1,000 a year. And I said, no, because in the place where I worked, when the war was over, they took us out of the laboratories and they gave you jobs in the offices. And I was earning what at that time was a nice salary. I said, no, that's very little. My husband said to me, look, they ask you for recommendations. Send it because they are not going to give it to you at any rate. But at least they, my mentor wouldn't be after me. Her, his mentor wanted him to live in the area. He had eight o'clock classes at a time when no Greyhound bus ran well. We lived about an hour from, from the school. He had to get up at five o'clock in the morning to take a bus at six o'clock to allow for the bus breaking down. And it always broke down lower. I'll never forget that. A second bus will be sent to make the eight o'clock class. So I sent the recommendations from the sisters. They said I had helped students, you know, I had taught students in the Hispanic program. And they called me and they told me they had raised the salary to $2,000. And they also said that I could do continue graduate degrees. I came to Maryland. They gave me a grammar the weekend before classes began. And I entered a classroom full of GIs of all ages. I was paralyzed. I thought. I mean, I taught without anybody telling me this is the way you should do it, but after all, my language is Spanish, I should know how to teach grammar. We still traveled from Baltimore to College Park. The buses were full of people, and, and I tell you, they were not selling cars or anything like that for the years of the war. We couldn't sit together, my husband and I. And one day, when my husband stood to take me to come out of the bus, one person there said, my lord, that's her husband. We came out of the bus and my husband said, they spend the time talking about an awful teacher or Spanish that they had. They say awful things about her and you are the person. What are you doing? I told him that they were older than I was, that they were GIs that, that I had never taught before and that I was afraid. <clears throat> he said, no. You know something they don't know, so you don't have to fear. Then he sat me down and told me how I should teach, how I should review them very well for an examination, how I should give examinations on the basis of 100, how I should help them in every manner and ask them to feel confident because they were asking me what they didn't know. I'll never forget that experience. From then on, I hope <laughs> that I love my students, and I think that love was reciprocated. I registered for the graduate courses. They allow us to take courses in other universities because the foreign language personnel, they had not returned. They had gone to work as translators or diplomats. So I did go to courses with a very famous comparative literature doctor, Hatzfeld at Catholic University and with a very famous historian at George Washington University, and went to Duke one summer and had Pedro Salinas, the famous Spanish poet, and Germán Arciniegas, a famous sociologist. But Maryland Natural was the center of my, of my attention, my, because Juan Ramón Jiménez was teaching there. I was going to teach uh, the veterans they assigned us an office, just got key. And one day, as I was entering the office, this lady came from the other end. She had a gracious way of walking. She smiled, and she asked me, and who are you? I said I was Graciela Nemes. She told me I am Zenobia Jimenez. And then it came out that I had lived in Puerto Rico and Cuba. 
and she had also been in Puerto Rico and Cuba. And then she said to me, my husband is Juan Ramon Jimenez. I jumped up and down. <laughs> and I began to recite to her all the stanzas of all the poems I have learned in my life. Like, it. she started laughing and she said, this girl knows of my husband's poetry. And then I was wasted no time to register in his courses. It was, um, it was a tremendous experience, which um, sort of gave me the impulse to dedicate myself to writing about him and his works and get some recognition, which I hadn't gotten otherwise. In two years, I did my master. By then, Juan Ramon had become my counselor because when I took courses in other universities, I was teaching 15 hours um, a week, and I didn't have time to consult with my professors in other places. So I started asking Juan Ramon about questions of culture and civilization and literature. Jimenez did not keep office hours. He invited everybody to go to his house for everything. He spoke French and Spanish. The wife knew Italian, French, English, and she was a translator. And when they car he carried conversation with the one who knew Spanish, you didn't even notice that she was translated. She was so quick. The entire foreign language department would go to the house in Riverdale to borrow books, to get information. He would give them recommendations for any great writer they wanted to get in touch with. Even students of English will go there. My master thesis was on Ezequiel Martinez Estrada, a, an Argentinian who wrote uh, a very important book. And he got me in touch with Argentinian writers and even with the author himself. I went to his house often. In the summer, I would go almost every afternoon. As I finished my master's degree, I had so much information about him, of the things he used to talk about his home and his life, and whenever I came home, I would write it. And then I said to him, I would like very much to write about you. And he said, fine, if you do a serious work. I don't want you to write about me and say all these things to praise me, no. I want you to do your research, become well informed, and be fair. You can talk about my enemies, you can talk about uh, how the people react to my poetry, but don't praise me. So he gave me information about his life that I needed, he gave me documents, he gave me books, and I began to write. I did finish the thesis. I defended it, they accepted it. In those days, we don't, didn't have the facilities we now have. You did seven copies carbon paper on a typewriter. My husband, naturally, doesn't know any Spanish. We didn't have money to have this done. So he said to me, I will type your thesis. The master and the doctor um, write it very clearly. We didn't have a typewriter. But the chair of the department said I could use the office typewriter after they closed the office. That was at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So after they closed the office, he would come and start typing seven copies carbon paper of my thesis. After I finished my PhD, Jimenez was ill. He was living in Puerto Rico then. And I knew that I had to convert that thesis into a book. So they invited me to go to visit them in Puerto Rico. I had the degree in 52 in June. My only son was born that very year in August. I stayed home for one semester for, with the baby. Then my mother and my husband told me that they will take care of the baby and I should continue so I would not lose the opportunity of becoming a college professor. The Jimenez invited me in Puerto Rico to spend some time with them in the summer so that I could continue my investigation. By then, they had their papers. They had come from Spain. Somebody had stolen them during the Civil War. They provided everything I needed to finish the book. It is important for me to say that he never interfered with my opinion of him or what I had to say about him. It was the first authorized biography and the only one that they read 
and approval. I think that has helped me considerably in my career. I was lucky enough to finish the book in 56 when he won the Nobel Prize. I documented the novel, all they needed I knew, and then the entire foreign language department signed the proposal. We were about 30 or 40 people, and of course, the chair, Dr. Zuko, was the principal signer. That was in February of 1956, and the 21st of October, all the newspapers in the Washington area had the news that Juan Ramón Jiménez had received the Nobel Prize. Our proposal worked out. When I accepted the invitation to teach, to be an instructor at the University of Maryland, to teach grammar to the GIs, I was an instructor for many years. And then, after I published my book, I hadn't been given any rank. In those days, they were a little careless about that sort of thing. So I told them that I had published a book, and the reviews were good. And I believe they made me then assistant professor. But shortly after that, when I was invited by the University of Wisconsin to be a visiting professor for one semester, for the first time, they raised my salary and they gave me the rank of associate professor, if I remember well. And very shortly after that, I was made full professor. In those days, women were not enraged at the universities. They forgot to get together every year and review the situation of a person teaching. I don't think they did it on purpose, but I did have to remind them. <laughs> I went where it was a foreign language department. Um, the important languages were French and German. They had introduced Russian, Chinese, and Peninsular Spanish. Latin American literature was not taught, but they would include the famous writers of different centuries at the end of a course on the Golden Age or of any other trend. And uh, one day, one of the professors said to me, prepare this course. I had never understood that literature. They used to teach it like literatura gauchesca, the Indianista, literature of the indigenous people. So I prepared the course. They would throw the course at me. I, I don't understand that literature. Why don't you do this? Then those professors, I remember them, they were tremendously kind. They themselves told me, after I had begun to teach different courses in Latin American literature, they say, why don't you propose that we had that literature considered among the other literatures, Hispanic American literature? They told me how to go about it. You had to ask permission from other committees and all this sort of thing and present uh, the proposal. So they accepted it, and then I started teaching Spanish-American literature. When the time came when all the universities began to introduce those courses per se, we already had a program. I know that our Spanish department grew from that time on. The department became really international because many students came from Argentina, from Chile, from Colombia. The Cuban exiles made the classes larger because all these people who had come to the area who had diplomas from the universities, they had to convalidate them. And I remember I had many Cuban students who were excellent. We were a small department without any reputation, but I tell you that all the great writers who came to Washington came to our university. We had all these great people come through our Spanish department. These people were modest. They were nice, they were friendly. They cared for the students, and it was Maryland that made it possible to get to know all these people. Octavio Paz came three times. He gave us a lecture, free, yeah? And the lecture was on material that appeared later in his books, like the book about Sor Juana. It was extraordinary. And what is more, we asked him, one of the graduate students, the one who helped me with the Spanish-American program, would he like to come to eat an Italian meal at the apartment of the students? Yes, he would. 
and the six of us talked that night with Octavio Paz about the great poems of the Hispanic world. It was fantastic. It was unforgettable. You know, he has autographed many books for me, and I am very grateful to him because he wrote about Rabindranath Tagore, and he mentioned a work I have written. One day, they gave him a reception at the Library of Congress. It was full of people, and the chair of the Hispanic room said, come that I want to introduce you to Octavio. And I said, I already know him, but she did not hear me because the people were like this. So he went and introduced me to Octavio. And he very kindly said, I have known Graciela for a long time. Borges was with us an entire day. They called me from the Argentina embassy. Borges didn't, was not scheduled for any meeting that day. Will we, we care to have him? I said yes immediately because I knew the chair was going to say yes. He came at 11 o'clock in the morning. We arranged for a lunch at the only place to eat on the campus, a cafeteria, a cafeteria. Invited some of the people from the English department who knew, will know who Borges was, and we went to eat with the students also. I remember crossing the campus, he was almost blind. He would tell me how beautiful this campus is. We arranged for the classes to meet at one of the rooms of the library, McKeldin Library, and we also arranged for the students to read a different short story or poem of his. One of the students asked him something about Edgar Allan Poe. He was greatly influenced by him, and he gave a lecture on Allan Poe. That evening, I heard him say, with great pride, I heard him say, how well prepared those students are from the University of Maryland. In Texas, the only thing that they asked me is about the gauchos. Really, it was a very proud moment for us. Miguel Delibes was the second person to occupy the Juan Ramon Jimenez chair. He came with his wife. He did not stay in a hotel, but in the house of a graduate student who had room, so that we saw him often. He attended the initiation of the Sigma Delta Pi. He was with the students all the time. He was a very plain man, also a very dear man. Saul Sosnowski came. Oh, I had to tell you about that. He was interviewed, and the chair of the department sent him to me. <laughs> I remember he was a tall boy with very curly black hair, very sure of himself. So we started talking, and he said to me, there are still people writing about the life and works of authors. <laughs> that was the title of my book, Vida y Obra de Juan Ramón Jiménez. Well, he seemed to be well prepared. And then he started working on the program with me. And the chair was leaving. So they asked me if I cared to be chair. No, I didn't. I used to, in the summers, when they went on vacation, I'd be interim. But I am not made for being the chair of the department. One day, Saul Sosnowski came and asked me, are you interested in the chairmanship? I said, not in the list. And then I said, are you? He says, yes. I say, good, I'll propose you. I propose him, and the chair of the committee asked me if I was crazy. I said, no, I am not crazy. I think he'd be very good. He has good ideas. He goes after things, and he finishes them. We didn't get along very well at the beginning, because he will do something that I didn't like, and I would tell him. And one day, he said to me, get off my back. I said, my son says that to me. I had no intention of doing it. And it was like that. When he told me, when he asked me, I was interested, I thought this fellow would make a very good chair. And then I started working his behalf. And lo and behold, he was elected chair. I remember he came knock at the door and brought me some white flowers. He attracted almost a generation of students from Argentina. And uh, he put us on the map. 
I, it, there was a change at that time. I think I had to do with a change in the manner in which the United States started looking at the Americas. And the students came then from the Latin American countries, many exiles. And of course, the program grew. There were many new buildings on campus, and we had our wonderful building for foreign languages, and it had no name. So I thought of the possibility that the name of Juan Ramón Jiménez be given to the building for what he represents in our history. And uh, I found out that had to be done at the high level, um, that the people of Maryland had to be in agreement that that should be done. Then I went to see Gladys Spellman, the representative in Congress of the Prince George's County, an extraordinary woman. I told her the story. And she took care of the situation. She contacted the Hispanic Caucus and the people of Prince George's County. The next thing I knew, in 1983, the building was given the name of Juan Ramon Jimenez. It has been a joy to see the university become what it is today, one is so proud. We were all so proud when we were only 7,000 students and a few professors and the campus was small. Juan Ramón Jiménez told me this. In this world, you, know, you should know how to elect. There are many choices. He said to me, you should know how to choose. I must have learned that lesson from him. I had the opportunity that this country gave me to do things, but you should know how to choose and you should go after that without any hesitation. I am grateful to Maryland, to the University of Maryland. If you have interest in becoming something, you can. I love teaching. I love the work at Maryland. I never retired. I stopped teaching because my husband became ill. Really, I never retired. I mean, I never retired. <laughs> <laughs> Paró el cielo un instante sobre el negro de los pinos, el viento huyó y se acercaron la hierba, el agua y el grillo. Yo iba cantando mi sueño por el camino perdido que va nadie sabe a dónde andando al lado del río y al pasar por la ruina del molino del morisco vi que estaba a la alta niña mirando al agua del río alta niña estás mirando como pasa el río mira por si pasa en la corriente un secreto
quedarán los pájaros cantando y se quedará mi huerto con su verde árbol y con su pozo blanco.